we are live. I'm just going to wait for a few seconds for more attendees to join in and then get started with the introductions. All right. I can see the attendee numbers going up. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Be Based Twice. I am Shweta Dhanapani. I'm the community builder at Be Based Twice. Many of you uh, would have attended our webinars in the past. Our last webinar was on based data in developing countries, which happened on the day before yesterday, and we had tremendously great response for it. So thank you very much for that. And the topic for today's webinar is EFW Transition Technology or Yesterday's Technology. And as our Professor Temanlis had emailed us that EFW is used mainly in the UK, it is all, it's called waste energy in the rest of the world. So we are going to be discussing waste energy. And uh, we have Adam Reed, uh, Chief Sustainability Officer and Director of External Affairs, Suez Recycling and Recovery, who will moderate today's discussion. He has moderated many other discussions on BBS Twice. Please check them out on our YouTube channel or on our website. Uh, Adam will speak today to Simone Applin, who's a technical director at anti Anti Group, Jakob Salin, head of environment and sustainability at SISAV, and Yarno Stead, waste and recycling manager at Westminster City Council. We've received a great number of questions from the registered members, which have been passed on to the panel. They will be in included in the discussion. Any other questions you have, please use the QA section. Adam will ensure that he goes through them very quickly. So over to you, Adam. Sweater, thank you. Thank you very much. Good to be back. It seems ages since we did a, a Be Waste Wise webinar together, but I, I know you've had a, a full program over the last few months. So as Sweater said, I'm, I'm going to facilitate the next 59 minutes, um, which means I'm keeping speakers to, uh, to attention. I'm going to make sure some of the questions that have already been sent in when you registered, so thank you for that audience, are, are, are asked and answered. Um, I've got one or two poll questions for you to answer as well. So keep you involved, um, see where we go and provoke a bit of discussion. Um, I, my, so my day job these days is, uh, is number one, ensuring that Suez, the, the, the global resource and waste management company, you know, is doing its bit in terms of uh, sustainability. And, uh, and I think that could be really difficult when people say, but you burn stuff. Um, and so that's kind of where we're starting this conversation today. You're, you're one of the problems. And, and I'm going to say, well, I don't think we are. And, and Suez have, have talked about EFW being a transition or waste to energy being a transition technology for almost a decade, because we've seen this transition. And I know Simone's going to talk about it, so I won't steal her thunder. But we've seen this transition as we move away from landfill, which was even worse for most people, to something that's better, namely recycling. But if you look at what Suez does... We're busy pushing the hierarchy as fast and as, and, and as, far, as far as we can. We want to be into re reuse, repair and recovery. We're already enabling our customers to prevent. And, and, and therefore, no, I don't want to burn stuff. That's, for me, you know, your, your, your last resort for stuff that can't, can't be used better somewhere else. So, um, so that's why I thought today's topic was, was still really, really you know, valuable because actually we've got legislation happening in the UK, you've got legislation in Europe, there's legislation happening around, around the world now that's looking at EFW or waste to energy with a different set of lenses. You know, is it about energy recovery? Is it about waste disposal? Is it about circularity? I, I think the lens is really important. So we've got three excellent speakers today, all with slightly different perspectives, all with different uh, experiences, but all who know their technologies inside out and the policy landscapes within which they work. So hopefully you're going to get plenty of opportunity to, um, to learn um, and to share. And if you've got questions, drop them in, please. Um, I can see the chat's buzzing already, Sweater, which is great. Um, and I'll make sure we, uh, we, we, we keep the panel uh, honest for the next 57 minutes. So let's hand it over. Simone, Simone Appling, you, uh, I, I won't introduce you. You can talk all about Anthesis as, uh, as much as you like in your seven minutes. But Simone and I have worked together um, for quite a while. Um, and it's always good to see you on a platform because I always enjoy hearing your perspective on technology. So Simone, welcome. Thank you very much, Adam. Yeah, and, and welcome everybody to joining the webinar. Um, as I said, I'm yeah, Simone Applin from Anthesis. Uh, we are, for those of you who haven't come across us yet, we are the largest group of sustainability experts in the world. Sustainability is all we do across a wide range of topics. Um, and we're proud to be a B Corp now. Um, we've got over a thousand colleagues across 40 different countries and as I say, we've got deep kind of subject matter expertise across a range of subjects. But what I do, I, uh, I'm i in the Waste and Resources team. Uh, I'm a technical director and I lead the UK uh, commercial due diligence work that we do. So that means that we work with 
the owners of EFW assets and the investors looking to invest in those assets to understand the market going forward and how we think that market and the future of EFW is going to look like, both from a regulatory point of view, you know, commercial point of view, to try and give them an understanding of, of, of what they're investing in or, or presenting what they're selling. So some of the insights I'm going to talk about this morning come from kind of that work that we've done. So Sweater, I don't know if you wanted to put the slides up, uh, my first one, and we'll talk about kind of where we've come from, because I think it's interesting, as Adam said, to acknowledge that although we're going to talk about a transition today and a transitional phase that we're all in towards the circular economy, actually that transition has been going on for quite a long time now. I've been in the waste sector for 25 years, and uh, I started as a waste manager, a, a landfill manager, which is very passe these days. But those days in 2000, so you, you can switch on to the first one, Sweater. In 2000, the UK was heavily reliant on landfill. We landfilled 88% of all the municipal waste we generated. We only, only got energy from waste from 8% and our uh, recycling rate was pathetically low at 11%. So it was much better in Europe and there, there was a reason we were called the dirty man of Europe because we were so reliant on landfill. And there was you know, speedy recognition of this and we've had a combination of policies that have really changed the position in the UK. You can see how quickly waste, waste to landfill has dropped off, whereas waste to energy from waste has increased. And that's been driven by a combination of carrots and sticks. So the carrots were uh, the government providing funding to local authorities to invest in EFW infrastructure and providing them support to procure those contracts with people who could build them. And then there was some really successful carrots as well. So the landfill tax in the UK has been incredibly successful at keeping waste out of landfill, making the commercials work. So people would rather take it somewhere higher up the waste hierarchy. And also putting caps on the amount that limiting the amount of municipal waste that local authorities could send to landfill. And you can say that see that clear kind of switch that's happened in the last kind of 10, 15 years or so. And the really good news is come 27, 28 in the UK, once we build those last few EFW plants in the pipeline, we're going to get up to capacity balance. So supply is going to meet the demand and we should be minimal, uh, landfilling only a minimal amount of waste. Do you want to switch on to the next one? But we know we're at the start of this next transition and this next transition is really driven by two things. The first thing is the need to create and implement a circular economy. The, the step from disposal to recovery, landfill to EFW, was a really, uh, you know, a really desperately needed one. But there's three steps higher on the waste hierarchy. There's recycling, there's reuse, and the long forgotten reduce at the top. I will say we want to increase reduction, but that's a bit of a, <laughs> a bit confusing language. So the circular economy policies that we have in the UK and have across the EU are going to impact on the amount of residual waste that's available to EFW operators. It's going to be a downward pressure. But it's worth noting that although in some cases there's a potential for oversupply of EFW capacity, in a lot of cases waste is going to continue to grow in the background. It just means that residual waste won't grow as quickly as it has done in the past, if you see what I mean, with these increasing recycling rates. That's, there's different situations in different countries. So we know in the Netherlands in particular, they had a big push to deliver a lot of EFW capacity and that was incredibly successful. But in the short term, at the moment, they're about 2 million tonnes over capacity. And when they push to reach the EU recycling targets, that gap is going to get even bigger. So the EFW is going to be about 2.5 million tonnes over capacity in the Netherlands. And those are all quite new plants. So that's kind of circular economy uh, principles, reducing the amount of residual waste, which is what we all want. It's also going to change the composition of the waste that ends up in EFW because we're hopefully going to be taking out more plastics in the front end. We're going to be removing organics to do cleverer and more meaningful things with those. So you're going to get a change in the calorific value of the waste produced, uh, treated by energy from waste. And actually, that almost works in operators' favour because the lower the CV, the more waste you can treat through your plant and the higher the revenue from gate fees. So that's uh, that's an interesting thing. But of course, it means that it uniformly across the board increases the capacity of, of the fleet as a whole. Um, so it will, again, make that uh, the residual waste treatment market much more a bit more competitive. 
So that's the one driver, circular economy policies. And then the other one is net zero. We all know that there's we've got ambitious targets to reduce uh, carbon emissions in the short term and, and aim for net zero in the long term. And that's going to start really impacting energy from waste directly, but also, and potentially more interestingly, indirectly as well. So we talk about the direct impacts. We all know that carbon pricing, carbon taxes are, are going to be in place in some form. The Netherlands, again, they've gone early. They've gone for a carbon tax of £33 a tonne and, and a published escalator. So people know in the Netherlands that, that the, the, um, the carrot, the stick is starting to bite there in terms of trying to direct more waste out of EFW. But we know that the UK has now published the intention for EFW sector to be in the European, the, the UK emissions trading scheme. And then in the EU, I think it's very much in the same direction, but we're waiting till 2026 to get a definite steer on that. So it's probably likely because we don't want to be doing things at the same time that both EU and UK sector, EFW sector will come into ETS in 2028. So that's going to start putting a price on the carbon that's emitted by EFW. And we know that it's about for every tonne you burn, you're getting a tonne of carbon going up the chimney. So to reduce that kind of exposure to ETS, then we're going to have EFWs are going to have to start looking at levers they can pull to reduce their, their exposure. And there's two really. One is um, carbon, sorry, one is reducing plastics in the front end, because if you, you reduce the fossil um, based content of your feedstock, then obviously there's less fossil based emissions going up the chimney. I always get told off for calling those anthropomorphic emissions by the carbon team, anthropogenic emissions. Um, and that's something that we can do relatively quickly and relatively cheaply. So we're looking, we you know, expect in the EFW sector to look at more pretreatment, dirty MRFs on the front end of EFW to reduce that fossil plastic that goes through their process. And then the other lever you can pull is CCS, carbon capture and storage. And of course, that's that's much more expensive to do. Uh, it's a longer term goal because we're at the start of that journey with carbon capture and storage for the waste sector. And it brings in lots of different nuances around what facilities can access that and what facilities can't. So I think it's going to be an interesting commercial discussion around how the economics of EFW stack up and whether some plants have advantages over other plants because they can easily access CCS and, and those that can't, etc. And then, so that's the direct impact, but there's also indirect impacts as well, because it's not just the waste sector that is focused on achieving net zero ambitions. There's a huge amount of um, focus on the waste sector from outside. So hard to decarbonize uh, sectors like aviation, heavy industry, are looking more and more at residual waste as potential feedstock for advanced conversion technologies that can generate hydrogen, low carbon fuels, biogenic fuels, you know, recycled fuels, all of these things. So whereas EFW was the only option other than landfill and nobody wants to landfill it, now we're going to start to see some competition in the market for these from the advanced conversion technologies. And how we kind of match those together is, is really interesting. And you know, I can see a di dichotomy in the way that we manage residual waste with high, high CV, high plastic content waste from MRF rejects and from this plastic separated from EFW being a real target waste stream for these advanced conversion technologies and then traditional EFW targeting the lower CV, low plastics feedstock that they can kind of, you know, bang through their plants. So there's a lot of kind of uh, wheels turning at the moment and I think that we need to be careful that we don't have any unintended consequences. Um, if you want to flick on to the next one, Sutter, sorry, I, I should have got you to switch on to that earlier. Um, yeah, it's definitely a, a time of real change. And I think we've had a steady state. Um, everybody felt confident in energy from waste. They felt confident on kind of long term prospects, long term pricing. And there's definitely this potential for things to really change in the residual waste market. I think the speed of change is important. I think, you know, we don't we don't want to to disadvantage EFW before we've got the infrastructure that we need to actually deliver a circular economy. Because if we do that, the, the you're going to get unintended consequences of it going to landfill or going places where you don't want it to go. So the timing of all these things together is really really important for policymakers to consider. And there's also the, the you know the, the last thing I want to leave it on is you know EFW has been a really 
robust and safe technology, reliable technology for us for many years. And we know it can take a range of different feedstocks. We know, you know, <laughs> we can predict it, we know how to work it. Um, and if we can put CCS and carbon capture um, and, and carbon reduction mechanisms on that, then that is all to the good. We don't know yet whether these advanced conversion technologies are going to do what they say we do, hopefully do the tonnage bit they're going to hope they're going to do. So that's why I'd leave it really. It's just that you just need to be really careful that we know we're in a transition. We know EFW has a really important role to play in that, potentially less in the future as, as cleverer things come into place. But the timing, I think, of the transition is really, really important. So I'm going to leave it there. Thanks, Simone. I mean, it's a really great overview. And, and, and although it was a UK focused one, actually, I think, you know, some of the journeys that are happening in countries around Europe, but, but more, more widely, I see we've got people from Australia, India, uh, and the US amongst others already on the call. I think what's really interesting is we're all facing this kind of changing feedstock, um, changing demand, changing end markets, changing legislative, you know, um, reality. So I think everywhere that's got EFW at the moment has got similar questions and, and those that haven't and are thinking about investing in it the way that we have as a bankable you know treatment solution are having to answer uh, many of the same questions so, so so thank you for that but Sweater can we ask the first poll question because I just wanted to get a flavor for where the audience are I mean you know are, are, they, are they all you know pro pro technology anti-technology or whatever so just just a quick question for the audience and, and, and while you're doing it I'm gonna I'm gonna um, get get a question into Simone but here's the question as a means of waste treatment and so therefore there's you know I've set the context for the question here everybody as a means of waste treatment is energy from waste or waste to energy dead dying or is it evolving you can only pick one and you've only got about 30 seconds to do it so do so and and, and while you're doing it I, Simone I'm, you know, I'm I'm fascinated by sort of the way that you know a, a lot of the you know the commentators in the market talk about you know many of the technologies that that we might evolve into don't really work at scale. Um, you know, many of these new demands for things like aviation fuels are unproven. I mean, ultimately, doesn't this come down to can we not recycle our way out of it or design our way out of having non-recyclable waste streams? Is, isn't that really the, the, the bigger question at, at play here? Yeah, I mean, totally. I think we can look for these new exciting things and get distracted by them, but that is ultimately the aim, isn't it? We want to absolutely maximize but reduce is the is the top one and i think that's always the elephant in the room that people forget about but those have got to be the priority over anything else that's that's the only way this is going to work but what i would say is there's there's there will always be residues that you can only recycle plastic so many times before it becomes a residue there's going to be parts of the world where it's very difficult to aggregate waste in you know to any kind of volume that's meaningful or you've got problems with transportation sure. and in those instances we've got to do something that maximizes the value of that material so i know that we you know we have the waste hierarchy as it stands but is act is advanced co <clears throat> and conversion technology that's going to be producing potentially producing all these things is that higher than efw do we need to look at the waste hierarchy again do we need to re look at the waste hierarchy in terms of carbon, because a lot of these technologies, chemical uh, plastics recycling, for example, pretty high in terms of energy demand. So you know, the, what happens in terms of carbon? So I think that, that, that question is so difficult to answer now, and it's gonna be horses for courses. And um, yeah, but I, think, I do think we need to start counting things in carbon now really, and, and try and make decisions based on that. Thank you. Right, so to show us what the audience have suggested at this point, right. Oh, hello. So what's this? We've got 0% think it's dead. Well, that's probably fair reflection. 17% dying and 83% think it's evolving. Uh, I'm going to invite uh, Jarno, Jarno Stepp from Westminster City to, uh, to join us. Hello, Jarno. How are you? Hi, Adam. I'm all right. Thank you very much. Um, now, now, I know that you like an EFW, and not only because it takes your residual waste today, but you like traveling the world looking at them. So you know, is that poll answer about right? Is it is it evolving? Have you I seen this say, happening? Yes, I would say so. So, you know, in order to understand energy from waste, you need to sort of trace the technology back into history. Now, it's probably going to outlive us all on this call because that technology has been around since 1874 when it was invented in the UK. Um, and its role keeps on evolving. And the plants we will see in the future will be very different than the plants we see today. 
Now, you know, when you look at, for example, the carbon element, it's sort of like comparable to how plants in the 1980s started focusing on, you know, the pollutants that were coming out of their chimneys, usually unabated. That process took probably 10 to 20 years to reach all the plants. And yes, some of the plants were closed because they simply weren't worth to retrofit. But, you know, to say energy from waste is dying, I've been hearing that since the 1970s. It's still here. It will keep on evolving. It's going to be here for a long time. It will have to deal with certain materials that we will have residual waste. It's unavoidable. You know, we're in the UK, we're reliant on consumers uh, segregating waste. If they don't, it's general waste. What do councils do with it? They have to get rid of it. You can't leave it on the street. Where are we going to send that? To landfill? No, any, not anymore. It's going into energy from waste. So, you know, it, it's so simple to say, like, oh, we won't have residual waste anymore. We will. You know, every ton you recycle still generates 200 to 300 kilos of residues in the most optimistic circumstances. Then we've got, a, you know, a mountain of materials that's increasing of stuff we don't want to recycle cycle because they contain hazardous substances like pops or PFAS, you want to destroy those, um, for which energy from waste is a perfect solution. It's a perfect thing to take those materials far away from people so they can't harm them anymore. Strong, strong opinions as always, Jarno. Now tell me, I, you know, you, the audience are reacting as you would expect them to. I mean, can we keep EFW affordable given all of this change that's happening? You know, so many other things happening upstream. Is it, is it, as, you know, you're, you're painting a picture of it transitioning, but still having uh, a key mm. role to play. Is that role specific to certain material streams and therefore the cost isn't such an issue because it's a necessary evil? I would say the cost is sort of an issue. Like when you looked at the 1980s, when a lot of plants worked unabated, they had an electro filter and that was it. The tonnage price was a fraction of what we pay today. Now, you know, when those plants had to be retrofitted, you know, authorities and, and providers and et cetera made investments and the tonnage price went up. That will happen again once we had to have to retrofit plants to make them future proof by capturing carbon or doing stuff with the input of the waste. So I think, you know, a a affordable is sort of a broad term and what the future looks like and what affordable looks like is very much decided by you know what's going to be implemented and what on what scale and and on you mentioned pops but, but uh, persistent organic that's polluting there we go there we go good test for everybody um i mean clearly that's a big big concern in the uk big concern in, yeah. in europe at the moment legislatively and regulatory but i'm assuming it's it's, it's a big issue globally for anybody handling this kind of material i mean i are we going to see a change in the way that EFWs operate and the materials that they therefore handle? Is that is that going to maintain their role? Yeah, potentially. You know, you're seeing you're seeing new regulations in the UK coming in that is sort of preventing materials that contain pops going into landfill or particular outlets and they have to be destroyed. Now, pops are not just in soft furnishings. They're in takeaway packaging. They're in paper bags. They're in all sorts of, you know, packaging materials that we use on a daily basis. That regulation comes from the Stockholm Convention. It's only really kicking off in the UK now. So the number of materials that, you know, you won't be able to recycle anymore, they'll have to go somewhere. They'll end up on the street. As a council, you have the duty to collect that waste and it has to go somewhere sensible. Right, thank you. Now, I'm just bringing Jacob in. Jacob's sitting in front of what looks like a, an, a, an unbelievably clean, beautiful looking CSAV uh, energy from waste plant um, somewhere in Sweden, I presume. Uh, how are you, Jacob? Fine, thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you all for the, this perfectly sort of uh, uh, the, the, the frame of what we're talking about. Uh, Simone and, and Jano and, and you, Adam, has done a great job to just uh, frame frame these questions. And I, this is an incredibly interesting subject as well. So I'm happy to be here. Well, now t tell us, you, you know, you're involved in operating these facilities, um, whereas, you know, Jano's the, the, the customer for them and Simone yeah. talks about them and evaluates them. So, you know, you're at the cutting edge. What's um you know how are you feeling about the exam question? I mean, have your plants are they running out of time or are they adapting and changing? I think it's a perfectly uh, well sort of question as well because I think there are they are evolving all the time and I, I agree with Jano putting it in a historical perspective of abatement systems and, and how that has affected uh, also the gate fees going going forward and and now with it with the with a net zero sort of framework and and resource management framework setting the fr setting the frames for for what is important here i think ccs will be also one of those drivers or, or for a different uh, maybe gate fee going forward and an affordable uh, 
of course, if you look at, I like to think also, who, who is the polluter is always a good thing to think about. So in this case, the, the need of waste treatment, I think, is a good way to sort of understand uh, where where the cost needs to come from somewhere. Uh, then again, big CCS, uh, I mean, CC units and then storage, it's going to cost a lot. And and I think I think it wouldn't need it, of course, uh, to be able to take those residual carbons that it that hasn't gone, uh, we, we, we haven't been able to to reduce or, or even uh, even prevent and then not been able to recycle those those carbon because we're, we're talking about net zero in the framework. It's carbon, it's carbon dioxide in, in, the, in the sense uh, when it comes out of a stack and also in, in carbons and materials. But I also like to point out that this context, you, I think we need to just frame in also plastic production in this sort of uh, material context because as we sit here today i mean it's i think it's 390 million tons of plastics being produced globally every year and that is uh, that is uh, expected to double to 2030 and 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 a 300 increase to 2060 and that's only uh, uh, what what the oil and chemical industries themselves say uh, and and what happens I mean, it's it's difficult to recycle us out of that input into into uh, the tech technosphere, so to speak. Um, so we need to do something, uh, and I think uh, we need to do a lot of upstream work. That that's the key key thing. And and Simone was also onto that question. A lot of upstream work, and I think that's why we are focusing both on upstream work and on downstream work. So we're focusing a lot on upstream work, both in dialogue, but also in sorting, and also in in what we can do and we can do with our partners upstream and and downstream from us with, for instance, plastic uh, plastic waste. But we see also that the the the, the demand for recycled plastics is is not there. It's not there at, at a scale yeah. that is needed, and that's also very, very important. That that, that needs to be uh, the right policy framework for that to happen. Uh, but both the carrot and the stick, in that sense, yeah. Uh, thanks, Jacob. I, I think you know both you and Simone have alluded to the, you know, for, for me, what I think makes our sector m most interesting today than ever before, which is when we were, you know, that linear economy. We were at the end, and our, our job was to keep people safe. Um, and, you know, you know, Yano's landfill sites did that. And then then it was the FWs because we were running out of landfill sites or yeah. or the cost of transport was too high or whatever it might be. And I think now we've got this much more complicated. What's that end market that Simone, you know, so rightly you know talked about? And I, and I think, you know, producing a fuel, whether it's for a cement kiln or it's for, a, you know, it's going to go into a chemical process or, you know, whatever circular solution it's going to be, they've got very explicit demands and they've, they've got their own economics and of course suddenly we're, we're entering a, a new market which we don't know we don't understand we, we we don't always control our own feedstocks i mean you and i have got the same problem there's a lot of people mm. to bringing stuff into our sites and it's not always easy to control exactly how much plastic or organics may or may not be in there so i think that, that, that it's really fascinating to watch all of these different policy uh, levers happening in parallel and you've got sort of political demands and the public demands I mean it's, it's a fascinating space but you, uh, the one question I want to draw on with you at the moment carbon capture brackets utilization close bracket storage depending on on, on your uh, solution I mean there's a lot of talk I mean you know I've been to lots of EFW conferences over the last two or three years everybody's looking at these these master projects yeah. and yet the cost for you and I you know, you're doubling the cost of your projects potentially, um, which which does make us a very expensive treatment solution. If our customers, yeah, I know in this case, yeah, um, are, aren't willing to pick up the real costs of the of the waste that they're handling, and ultimately, therefore, the public or or the businesses who generate that waste in the first place. I, I think carbon accounting, I think, is really important for driving yeah. change upstream. But at some point, it's going to hit our system very hard. You know, ETS in the U in the UK, ETS in, in Europe in particular, and similar systems, of course, in in, in America. Um, are, are are we ready to make CCS happen quickly enough for, for the policy landscape? Do you think? I'd say. I mean, I think I say we're we're already late, <laughs> of course. But yeah, the, to answer your question in a little more elaborative way, I, I say we're we're, we're there. 
but but we, we're late and and I think also that the incentives uh, needs to be at the right places uh, b beforehand and and I mean and, and but we can't wait for these big projects going on board we, we need to do it now in order to to actually have the, have them in place 2030 or, or even before that in some cases so I, I think that the framework won't be perfectly fitted uh, and there are lots of risks going forward and and that's the landscape right now but i think i mean i, I was in a conference call with with the the the, the, um, the people working with the greenhouse gas protocol and i was trying to get in just a little bit of uh, with the scope three for instance how do you account for scope three because right now if you if you if you hand if you if you uh, um, if you you if Jano uh, sort of goes to your your Suez facility in the UK and says take care of my waste you're not going to have those uh, emissions in your scope three but because uh, uh, I mean Jano is not going to have it in scope three uh, uh, you're going to have it in your scope one exactly and yeah. and that's because you are an energy recovery facility with a good energy recovery rate but if you would have just burnt them this greenhouse gas protocol now says okay then Jano would have uh, the scope three emissions so we need to create the right incentives yeah. it shouldn't be where the product ends up it should be who who has the sort of the right choices the 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 who can make the, the great changes here and that is upstream of course but we need to help help the, the, the right incentive structures to to be in place That's and greenhouse gas protocol is, is one of those of course and then there's other other policy frameworks and uh, lca analysis uh, epds and and so on and so on but i think to put the right incentives on the right places for the right choices upstream is key and with that help with that as well I, I mean, I think you raised lots of really, really valuable points there, uh, Jacob. And I think we're, in the analysis we've done in the UK, we think maybe half the existing fleet of EFWs could yeah. put carbon capture solutions on them. Yeah. But the yeah. other half, it's never going to work. Uh, no. and, and, and ultimately, those plants will close yeah. and might be replaced by some of Simone's sort of our new advanced conversion technologies, you know, feeding new markets. So I think yeah. there's this, this constant churn. So let's ask the question of the audience, uh, Sweta, because we've talked a bit about CCS and CCCUS. I mean, you know, everybody, wh where, where are you on this? Is it, is it the saviour of traditional energy from waste technologies? Um, it's a yes or no, or, or am I asking you the wrong question? You're allowed to vote out that one. Um, and, and while you're voting on that one, I'm going to come back to Simone briefly because there's a lot of chatter in the in the um, in the audience participation box about LCA and is carbon really the right metric? Um, I mean, we're trying to keep it simple because policy that has too many metrics tends to fail, in my experience. So, is carbon good enough to get most of the right decisions made when it comes to technology mixes and and, and ultimate treatment of waste? Oh, there's a lot in that question, Adam. Um, <laughs> firstly, on the metrics thing, I absolutely agree with you that if, if we have complicated policy that requires complicated numbers that we don't have or we're just getting at, it is absolutely meaningless. So, as you know, I'm a waste data geek and we've suffered, suffered with a lack of waste data for so long. And now we're trying to do EPR and, you know, pay money on the basis of numbers that are very, very hard to find. So I'm absolutely on board with simplicity. Carbon is very complicated. I mean, we work with EFW operators to, to set interim targets, you know, to do SBTI targets, um, work out what their, their, their emissions are, do LCAs on all these innovative products like, um, you know, products that are waste to X technologies. And all of these people are having to pay, you know, I think they're terribly good value for money, but they're having to pay experts to do this because it is such an incomplicated thing to do. Yeah. Um, and it is actually, it is very complicated, but importantly, it it tells us the answer about what the right thing to do is. So I think we've got a way, find a way of bringing this all together and simplifying this to, to inform policy decisions. And then that policy then is simplified in terms of giving steer about what's better over, you know, what's better and what's worse. Yep. when you're when you're making those decisions so i think it is complicated but i think the world is complicated um and ultimately yeah. something like your hierarchy whether it's the traditional you know hierarchy or whether it's a future carbon hierarchy it has to be simple enough for my mum or you know yano's director to make a decision about a contract or an, or an activity because if it's not then we end up with this kind of like you know hiatus 
uh, where we're all like scratching our heads trying to do the maths. It, exactly. We have to make it simple, don't we, at some point? We do. And, you know, we're not just like you said, we're not talking about just the waste sector in isolation anymore. This is where the complica complexity comes in, because you actually say, well, you know, if you're going to use that waste to produce a aviation fuel that then offsets something, you know, the scope of those assessments then yeah. become really big. But this is, I think, part of you know what we need to get our head around in, in the next kind of four or five years quickly. Sweater, can we see the results, please, just quickly? And say, oh, look, there's a mixed bag in here. What do we got? I'm going to get Jano to, to comment on this. But 34% saying, yes, it's the saviour. 36% saying no. And 30% saying you're asking the wrong question, Adam. Well, I knew I was asking the wrong question. But Jano, I mean, where are you? Is CCS part of the solution? Oh. It, yeah, it's certainly part of the solution to take, you know, the, the problematic bit of carbon. Yeah, all carbon by its very essence that goes into the atmosphere is, is problematic, but it's it's the fossil part that, that's worrying us, right? That's the additional bit. Um, so if you've got plants that can take it out, yes, absolutely, that's part of the solution. And, you know, as part of, you know, a plant's natural life cycle, at some point, the operator will make a decision, no, I'm not going to refurbish this plant anymore because it's at the end of its life. So, you know, the, 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 the CCS, CCU, application might speed that process up and there will be yeah, as you said maybe half of the plants will be uh, suitable for uh, adaption then again we've got a fleet going back from the 90 to the 1970s in the uk they might be due for renewal so it's sort of natural progression and you saw the same thing when you know proper pollution abatement came in a large number of plants closed because they just simply weren't economic to run anymore and it's just sort of history repeating itself but then for a different topic I, was, I thought you were going to say history recycling itself for a moment. Yeah, that, it's, it's the ultimate form of recycling, are. right? Yeah, <laughs> seen this all before. Thank, thanks for that. Um, a lot of commentary coming in from the audience. Thanks for this. I'm going to try and get questions, you know, into the into the panel as best we can. I mean, a lot of it, you know, how do we make this, you know, relevant to to, to people? I mean, you know, the whole debate, you know, Jacob's raised that scope one for one versus scope three for another i think you know that that's a whole head case kind of you know around the dinner table my mum going ouch it just it's exactly. reality. <laughs> but but i think we, we we've got to somehow make some of this relevant to everybody in every day's life and i'm just thinking you know you know get, get you know wandering down the high street chatting to the public as i sometimes do not as much as i used to but you know it used to be easy wasn't it do you recycle this can you recycle that i mean you know that was the kind of conversation we were having a decade ago now the conversation is well if you produce this or you use this would you rather it went here to produce energy? Would you rather it went over here, but you've got to do something very different to it for it to be recycled? Or are you happy that it now becomes part of your fuel because you want to go on holiday to Greece next week? I mean, it's such a much more complicated picture. And yet we almost need everybody to get the basics to understand that, that connectivity, because if we don't, we end up with these siloed dis discussions about, well, you know, energy from waste is bad because it's, you know, there's carbon, po you know, pollution. And yet, actually, the pollution is all about the material that's been generated by somebody else in the value chain. But they're in a different silo. I mean, Simone, you work across the value chain. I mean, you know, you're helping companies, you know, on the design aspects and the life cycle thinking. You know, I, how do we make some of that work better in terms of those decisions? Is it simply about having carbon taxes running through all of the system? Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, we, we work for some big people in the supply chain, people you'd heard of like Amazon and Microsoft and Tesco's. Um, and we have those conversations all the time. So I think the, the one thing that, that I think we need to move faster on is we talk about recycling a lot and people talk about setting recycling rates and, um, you know, caught on a corporate level, a lot of people are very committed on re you know, reducing their carbon impacts through recycling but of course circular economy is not all recycling it's real circular business models so reuse um reduction and i think in terms of packaging design you will see on the television we all kind of laundry tablets are now in cardboard packaging and things like that and that, that's happening really quickly but it takes about five to seven years for to change a packaging format in a company because they have to invest in the machines to make that packaging you know and it takes a long long time for them to do that so the speed of change is sometimes slow but i think i when i get my most excited i, I well, not most excited remember for that different way. <laughs> my, 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 my most encouraged is when i think well if we're going to have a circular economy we the the waste sector has a key role to play in that in terms of collecting separated materials that's what we're all aiming at is is making the, the collecting the largest amount of high quality materials from the waste producer from the curbside and how do we do that 
it is an education piece, but it is also, I think, the, the waste sector is extremely well placed to do that because if nothing else, it's the logistics of the waste sector is incredible. And, you know, there's, there's so much potential to repurpose that into, you know, collecting stuff from householders, taking it back to the right place, providing those kind of infrastructure for circular business models. And I think that's something that it's probably some years down the line, but I expect you're probably already looking at that, Adam. Well, serious do have a, do have a you know a tendency to want to look beyond the immediacy, and uh and yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, we're we're fascinated by where some of this may go, and you know, the role of a, a resource management company, you know, linking multiple markets and 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 customers and we talk about customers at both ends of course we've got customers that want material yeah. and we've got customers that we want to take material from and how do we get get you know how do we educate everybody so we've all got a, you know a clear vision of what the future might be these webinars are all about trying to you know open the you know pandora's box about where we might be going and and, and getting people aligned so well actually that sounds like a pr pragmatic set of evolutionary steps because we it, none of us have got the old magic magic dust have we so you know some of this we're gonna have to kind of you know suck it and see and i think sharing it with a panel like this and with an audience that's as engaged as this one is is, is an absolutely essential step um lots of questions coming in so let's 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 um put a couple up um Jacob, tell me about um ash coming out of efw really quick simple answer how much per ton of material going in ends up as ash and how much of it gets recycled once it is ash yeah uh, bottom ash approximately 15 to 18 percent of what goes in uh, weight wise and then maybe three to uh, four percent of somewhat there uh, on with fly ash in, in weight percentage and, and the bottom ash, I mean, we have a state-of-the-art uh, sorting facility for the bottom ash to take out even more stuff from that, NF metals, magnetic metals, and then, then actually uh, uh, having that bottom ash uh, then, uh, then uh, sort of uh, get a bit of age and get a bit of carbon dioxide actually from the atmosphere also uh, and, and have, have it a little bit mature. And then we actually have that one uh, as, as a construction material. Uh, it's quite difficult legislative and, and it's I mean we have lots of lots of uh, controlling mechanisms into environment control on it. But the material is perfect for construction, which is brilliant. But we are not there ramping up 100% of the bottom mash to, yeah. to construction material yet. But there is potential for it, which is really good. But of course, there, there is you need to have a really good waste to energy plant. You need to have the sorting facility. You need to have a uh, location and, and place for the maturing process and so on and so on. And you need to have experts on how to get it out in society, uh, which still is, is controlled in a good way. So there's lots of lots of uh, I mean, difficulties with it, but I think it's a, there's a huge potential. We have people working on it, uh, I mean, as, as their job at CESAV, just getting that one out to, to be able to actually reduce the, 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 the need of, 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 uh, uh, of, um, um, of other other natural uh, gravel and so on, which is not an abundance, of course. So, so this is a very mean, important thing. And I think that's another one of those examples of an evolution of the of the you know energy recovery technologies. Is that over time we've we've started to pull materials out at different yeah. points in the process because yeah. there's markets for them, or because yeah. legislative change, as Iano alluded to, meant certain certain bits yeah. of technology just didn't work anymore or weren't viable. So, but but, I think but that that being said, I mean it's not it's not I mean still uh, I, can, I think we can compare maybe energy from ways to CCS in a, in, a, in a way because you see somewhat of an end of pipe solution. Uh, and this is what we do with a, with a waste that we can't do anything else with. That's always the frame of, of where waste to energy comes in and a different waste comes in into the context. And, and we should always be very focused on that. But if we have done all that we can in society with that material waste streams, then we can do something uh, uh, via or, 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 or thanks to waste to energy or energy from waste plants, but only then. Good point. Like that. Uh, yeah, I know. Lots of questions coming in about scale. Um, mm. uh, EFWs, they're big. Um, some people have said they're ugly, really? but, you know, we, we've seen some beautiful ones as well, haven't we? But, I mean, is, is scale the an important issue with EFW go forward, particularly given, 
I guess that there's people listening from all over the world yeah. uh, to our call. What they used to. Yeah, it, it's sort of, you know, plant size can range from small 20,000 ton a year plants to plants that burn close to 2 million tons, like the ones that are recently being opened in China and in Dubai. So, you know, it's a very scalable technology and it depends on your local context. And if your local context is better for a smaller plant, you know, also taking into consideration that smaller plants tend to be more expensive via the gate fee and operational cost and a larger plant you need to find that balance as to what optimum size is good for you and that can vary according to local circumstances so in the uk you can see that you know most of the plants that are currently being built are sort of around the 350 to maybe 500,000 700,000 ton mark um, in other places in the world, if you look at some of the Swedish plants, for example, you know, Jakob is an, exa an exception because it's a large plant, but their plants are a bit smaller because of local circumstances. So what optimum size is best for you um, will vary. And, you know, if you were in China, you know, the building plants that do two million tons a year because they have cities that produce 10,000 tons of solid waste a day. So you need to, you know, you need yeah. to scale up your technology then. So it's very, very um, variable in, in what size, what plant size is right for you. And and for uh, Jona and Jakob, um, yeah, the UK doesn't have a lot of heat offtake compared to, say, Sweden yeah. or, or Denmark or Norway. Um, and so, you know, some of the audience are going, well, why are you talking about carbon capture when you can't even get heat offtake? I mean, I, I, there's good reasons that UK doesn't have heat, good heat offtake, partly, you know, the, the, the retrofit costs to the to the local infrastructure. But I mean, as a policy decision, heat offtake seems to be a, a, you know, for cooling in hot climates as well. Seems to be an obvious thing that, that could be promoted in areas that are looking to expand their absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, you know, what we've got in the UK as well is that the natural gas network was there already before we even started developing these plants. So people were heating with cheap North Sea gas because the UK has got abundant gas supplies from the North Sea or used to have. Um, so that's what people heated with. So then when you start developing your plants and it was a large rush to, to develop plants in sort of like the 2000 onwards, there were very limited options. Plus, they were sited perhaps in places that were a bit out of the way so people wouldn't complain about them, meaning it would be difficult to get the energy to where it's needed. You know, we're making some progress um, with, you know, we're building new generations of plant that are literally providing heat to industry and heating networks. But that wasn't necessarily the case in the past. And that will be difficult to put right because they are in the you know in a different different location um plus it's got you know perhaps alternative fuels that are better suited so you know do you want to push someone to connect to a district heating network when perhaps heat pumps are the best option you know i can't judge on that from a distance but that's the sort of local things that you need to take into consideration yeah. in sweden I... it was a different story they didn't have gas no, um exactly. <laughs> they, they 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 needed heat so they developed district heating from yeah. you know the turn of the century onward so it's a very mature technology there and you know yeah. Jakob and i've had conversations about this in the past yeah, um, yeah. It, it's a very different context i totally agree i mean most of the district heating network were already in place in the 50s 60s and hence uh, the, 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 the the payment for it were, were, was was historically uh, done but but sweden has developed and, and evolved also in district heating sector a lot since then of course but it's a lot easier to evolve and develop uh, uh, an existing technology an existing uh, infrastructure than than to build a new one and to build a new district heating grid is, is very costly of course uh, I, and I think Simone, what 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 my uh, your two colleagues here are suggesting is that context and geography are everything. And of yeah. course, when it comes to policy, we're not all working to exactly the same set of policies. Not everybody's pushing carbon or or greenhouse gas abatement in the same way at the same speed, are they? So just because the market for EFW might be dwindling in one geography doesn't mean it's going to dwindle at the same pace anywhere else. No, that's very true. And there's there's. Like I said, there's, there's different kind of capacity and demand situations in different parts of the world. So, you know, in, in some kind of Eastern Europe, we're still landfilling a huge amount. So, you know, EFW is a, is a really good short to, a, a solution to that. But I think you're right. I mean, we've got, so, you know, we have some parts of the UK who've got moratorium on any more EFW capacity. We've got um, bans on biodegradable waste to landfill coming in at different times. I'm just talking about the UK specifically, but other countries are looking at some of these too. And I think it's always a bit of a concern that you're going to have unintended consequences, at least in the short term, with waste moving somewhere else instead. So you can um, you know, put a cap on EFW capacity in one area, 
And then if we don't have the infrastructure in place to really push those circular models and deliver them, uh, deliver more recycling uh, and deal with the rejects, then you get the waste traveling to the area that doesn't have the moratorium. And similar with bans on biodegradable waste to landfill. So I think it's really important. These things are often driven by different government departments. So you've got Desnes doing the carbon stuff and DEFRA doing the recycling stuff. And, and everybody just needs to be very careful in this complex period that we're all working to the deliverable timescales with the waste sector. Because um, I think everybody wants the same thing, but we just need to do it at the right time. And I, and I think that's important that, you know, people recognise that just because you're building or have recently built an, you know, an energy recovery facility or a waste or energy plant, you know, you're still into your resource management. You're still trying to, you know, reduce pollution. You know, we're, we're, we're not, you know, burning for the sake of burning. And I think it's important that, you know, sometimes the campaign groups will often see us as the problem, whereas, you know, sometimes we're just, we're the back end of the problem. And, and it's difficult to understand the complexity of the problem. And, and our job is to perhaps, you know, help, help, you know, share and, and, and open some of these discussions. So um, I've got one more poll question, audience. So uh, keep watching uh, and I'll get the uh, panel's reflections on this one in a moment. So if you can launch the, uh, the final one for me, Sweater, that'd be great. So this one, uh, I'm just looking at the future role of waste to energy. Is it going to be a transition technology as we move to more circular solutions, as we move to more segregated material streams? Is it, you know, the last line of treatment for badly designed stuff? That's the only time you can use it. End of discussion. Or no, there is no role. We've got moratoria. We're not interested. Go away. Don't, don't even mention it on another webinar. They're your three options. Uh, have a vote on those. Um, quick question come in. I mean, is the future for UK EFWs, uh, Simone, to produce syngas for, for grid injection? I think it's a yes or no or, 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 or a maybe. Uh, but, well, for, I can certainly see it for organic waste streams. And that's a whole different webinar, uh, Sweater. Organic waste streams, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll park that one, but I think it's a really good topic because a lot of the questions coming in have started to say, where's the organics going? Okay. But it's going outside of EFW in the future because of segregated collections. and All, yeah. Already happening in Sweden, I'd say, several years back as well. Yeah. And, and AD Always process and biogas and methane and, and uh, vehicle gas production on that. We've done that for several years since we... <laughs> So you're going to speak on that one as well, are you? Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe not me, maybe my <laughs> colleague. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Um, so, uh, Sweater, show me, show me the results. Let's see what the uh, let's see what the audience have said on this one. Okay. Well, fifty-seven percent. It's a transition technology, and forty-three percent. It's the last line of defence. Simone, is that what you expected, given that earlier we heard, uh, you know, from the from the audience what their thoughts were initially in terms of of EFW is it, does that does that feel about right for you yeah I think so I think it's it, it, your question wording is slightly woolly so I'm going to kind of bank on the ambiguity of that I, I think um you know it is a trend if you if you look at if you banked into EFW the conventional EFW as well as all the advanced conversion and the advanced thermal stuff is it transition technology absolutely and I think it has a strong role to play in the future and yeah I totally get I get the people who are concerned that it's 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 destroying valuable materials and should only be used as a last resort. But I think we've, there's a journey to get to that point. And, and I think that's exactly where the, you know, the webinar's inception came from was this concept that it's not simply switching something on and off because people say to me, turn off EFWs tomorrow. Well, you can't really, you know, that just doesn't work because society is still producing stuff. So yeah, managing a transition, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. And when people say to me, how long has EFW got? to roll I'm, I'm i'm a generational kind of guy I, I, you know give me 20 25 years a lot of the infrastructure in the uk will have had its time and will be replaced by things that are very specific to new end market demands and i think that's the transition that i think a lot of us are, are confident of right um quick mention a great point just come in um about extended producer responsibility and, it, and if the uh if the producers the big brands could see the true costs of the waste that they are helping to produce, they might actually decide to redesign it or better, even manage it themselves. I'm not sure I like the idea of that. Jacob and I quite like our day jobs at the moment, but um, you know, <laughs> 25 years from now, maybe I'll, 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 I'll bite the bullet. Um, panel, we've got a couple of minutes to wrap up. So always good to hear your thoughts. So where are we? You, you know, you, you, you've been on the, on the panel sharing your thoughts. What are your final takeaways, Jacob? Where, where, you know, where next for EFW? What's the what's just over the horizon? 
Right. Yeah, I think I think the 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 the, the audience sort of pinpointed exactly where we are. <laughs> I mean, I think it's good that we have sort of half half saying uh, last resort uh, for for battle stuff, uh, battle design stuff, and then uh, evolving at the same time. And and somewhere in between is where we where we are. And we should of course aim for for the the role sort of decreasing, but not uh, as a result of not doing nothing upstream. We need to do a lot of things upstream. And we've been on to the in incentive sort of discussion and. And where to put that incentive to to make the most out of it and, and get the most, best results downstream where we are. Uh, and for me, I, I'd love to say a decrease in in the dependency in some in some manner. But seeing what what is sort of pushed into society, I mean, I, I, there, there is a little little bit of of, of negative thoughts on my side uh, there. Uh, I mean, right now, ninety nine percent of the the plastic being produced is fossil. Uh, I mean, out of the global oil use, eight percent goes to plastic production, right now, uh, which is a lot. Uh, and then, and then, what is recycled are the plastic put on market in Europe, ten percent. And that's just where you take the measure point of recycling, also, yeah. uh, and and not even considering if it goes into a, a sort of a. a, a a plant pot or or actually the same kind of product which is also a different case so i mean in that perspective yes i agree adam i think i think there's a role to play coming coming uh, i mean quite 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 a few years going forward but we always need to educate upstream we always need to 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 be be in partnership with with your customer simon of course and we need to be there we need to help and we need to educate that's my Thank you. Absolutely. No disagreement from me. Where are we? Uh, Jano, looking ahead. What's next? I think, I think you know, it, it, it's, yes, we want to recycle more, but what we shouldn't forget is that, you know, councils, municipalities have got no control or very little control over what people consume. That's an emotive topic, what I buy in the shop and what I throw away. So councils, for our role, you know, we, we try and influence people and say, do you really want to buy this? Why are you buying this? You know, it's a difficult decision. It's a lifestyle change. You know, perhaps, yeah, I don't want to give up using certain single-use items. I'm realistic about it. We need to remain realistic about we, what we can achieve that does mean stuff will end up on the street it has to go somewhere in the uk councils have got very limited means to enforce jacob you've got the benefit that in sweden you've got quite robust enforcement regimes that you know if the wrong thing goes in the wrong bin you know ultimately you might end up in court we can't do that in the uk it's on the street it has to go so you know where is that waste going to go we have to remain re realistic councils uh, can't really enforce there's also no option to put the financial price through to the waste producer there's no incentive to recycle um there's also uh, no ability to put a price on residual waste collections It's banned by law in the uk so you know with with lo for local authorities our wings are often clipped and we've got no option but to deal with the waste that's on the street and yes we would love everyone to put the right thing in the right bin for but for a lot of people it's like right it's in the bin it's the end of my story i don't care about it I put it out it's the council's problem and that's the sort of the mindset that we need to change. Plus, you know, the the increase of poorly designed products, you know, the advance of, of Zara and Primark with like, you know, fast fashion and low quality materials that, you know, no one really can't really recycle them. They're low quality items. It's not built to last. It's built to be disposed of. That's the type of thing that needs to change. But ultimately, we need to reduce how much we consume. And that's a very tough question for a lot of people. And they'll turn their heads away because, you you know, you want to buy a new iPhone. Oh, I shouldn't buy a new iPhone because, you know, the resource use It's that type of thing. You know, people are emotional animals um, and they'll make certain decisions that will generate waste. Thank you, Yana. Yeah, you raise a lot of really good points. And, you know, you can see why there's been inertia around, you know, some, some of this progress because you've got to change a lot of things. And sometimes governments yeah. don't, don't want to bite the difficult bullet, do they? Uh, Simone, the final word's yours, and it's probably going to have to be a hashtag sentence rather than yeah. a paragraph. I'm looking at the middle. So I'm the hard to recycle stuff is what I'm excited about in the short term. I think we've got really good infrastructure for recycling. Uh, really easy to recycle stuff like PET and everything else. But there's a gap, isn't there, between that and EFW. What can we take out in the middle with these new emerging technologies, either for fuels, chemical recycling, those kind of things. That's what I'm excited about in the short to medium term. And it might solve some of Yarno's problems with his single use cutlery. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing like an excited Simone to end a, a webinar, is there? It's just good to know. Thank you, Simone. Um, Sweater, I'm going to come back to you. Listen, uh, audience, thanks for the questions and the participation. 
we'll get all of the questions to all of the panelists to make sure the ones that I didn't ask, because of course there were too many, do get answered and we'll get back to you. And of course, yes, there will be a recording available to watch this back later if you're uh, so inclined. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure hosting um, and watch out for my tweets because I'll be hashtagging a load of this later today because uh, I've learned a lot and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed your time and the time of my expert panel. So thank you, Iano, Iacob and Simone. Sweater, back to you. Thank you, Adam. And uh, thanks to the, uh, all the other panelists as well. And I know we received a lot of questions about the recording. It'll be there on the BBS Press website. It'll be there on our YouTube channel. And I've dropped the link uh, to sign up for the newsletter on chat. So please sign up and you will get all the updates. So bye-bye, everyone. Thanks for a great webinar. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Bye, everyone.